and murder of um, innocents, um, just we girls is, is particularly horrific. Black was finally arrested in 1990 after trying to snatch a young girl in broad daylight. He was eventually convicted of four child murders between 1981 and 1986. His youngest victim was only five years old. I think the impact of the Robert Black case on the community and on the nation was pretty devastating. This was the end of the idea of, of the innocence of childhood. After the Black case, I think parents started putting more restrictions on their children's freedom. Pat Cardi's nine-year-old daughter, Jennifer, was abducted and murdered by Black in 1981. But it would take several years before she knew who was responsible for killing her daughter. We still miss, miss her, particularly our two boys when she was taken. How hard, how difficult, how heavy it was upon them not understanding anything, but just knowing that she would never be there again. That was brutal. Journalist Tim Tate investigated Black's life in the hope of discovering why he did what he did. They were terrible crimes. He probably killed more children than any other convicted child sex serial killer in Britain. This killer's story begins in 1947. Robert Black was born on the 21st of April in Grangemouth, about 20 miles from Edinburgh, Scotland. Robert Black's mother was unmarried at the time. There was a real stigma around illegitimacy, so he was given up. Now, his mother went on to get married and to have four other children, but she never, ever wanted anything to do with Robert Black. So right from the outset, this is, is somebody who's facing rejection and exclusion. He's somebody who has come into the world with a stigma on him. Black was fostered by Jack and Margaret Tulip, who lived in a remote Western Scottish village. They were in their mid-50s. They had no previous experience. They were strict, they were God-fearing, and he's never given their name. He's always Robert Black, something that would have marked him out at the time in that small community. Black later alleged that his foster parents were abusive towards him. The foster father died when he was five, but the foster mother uh, continued the abusive behavior that had been perpetrated beforehand. So he was beaten when he wet the bed. Here is somebody who does not have a, a safe or a secure home environment. This is uh, a young boy who has got no comfort from anybody whatsoever. From this disturbed upbringing, Black unsurprisingly rebelled and developed an unhealthy interest in other children. By the age of eight, he started offending. He's already developed sexualized behavior. He's taking the time and the trouble to peer up little girls' skirts. He has molested, that's putting it gently, a baby. And he's begun to explore bodily orifices. This is the obsession that will be with him all his life. In 1958, Black's foster mother died and he was sent to a children's home near Falkirk. His fascination with sex continued, and along with some other boys in the house, he tried to rape a 12-year-old girl. I think that act, if you like, was the genesis of Black's paedophilia. At some point, almost every pedophile who's attracted to a very young girl... ...was always on the lookout uh, for his next victim. And he had, in the back of his van, what can only be described as a, an abduction kit. He had bindings, he had um, this sack which he would put the child in. On the 30th of July, 1982, Black was on a delivery job in Northumberland, North East England, near to the village of Coldstream, where a young schoolgirl was leaving her house to go and play with her friends. Susan Maxwell is 11. She lives with her mum and her stepdad and their children in a little village. It's a happy, warm, loving home. 
It's a summer, it's afternoon. Susan says she wants to go and play tennis with her friend, and it's agreed that Susan will walk home. The tragic, tragic irony is that she encounters none other than Robert Black and his van. She had begun walking home, and at some point after 4.30, which is the last time anyone saw her, she was snatched, literally snatched, put in the black of Black's van and driven away. Susan's mother had changed her mind about letting Susan walk home and decided to pick her daughter up, but there was no sign of her anywhere and she called the police. Tom Wood was the detective inspector at the Lothian and Borders Serious Crime Squad. We were sent down to the borders straight away to help with the investigation and there were huge searches made uh, off the area because we thought that um, she might have been thrown over the bridge or fallen over the bridge or, or might have come to harm locally. On the 12th of August, a body was found near a village in a lay-by in the West Midlands, over 200 miles from where Susan had been abducted. It was the middle of the summer, and so the body was badly decomposed to the extent it was some time before we discovered that it was actually Susan. That made it impossible for the coroner to determine an exact cause of death. Susan was found partially clothed, indicating that she'd been sexually assaulted. The police were desperate to find the person responsible for such a heinous act. Most people are murdered by someone close to them. So we had to be very, very careful that we didn't go off on flights of fancy and that we did our homework first. Who was with her? When was she last seen? We then looked at local offenders. Were there any young men around who were committing sexual offences? And then we started on the big investigations looking for vehicles that were seen in the vicinity. And we got absolutely nowhere with it whatsoever. Well, Black avoided capture sets of characteristics that was physical, that had to do with his fixation. And that second criteria was that, that no adults had to be near that child or nearby responsible for taking care of that child. He would rehearse, he would drive round and round, even if he saw a child who he thought matched his image of an ideal victim. He wouldn't abduct straight away. He would monitor, he would look for escape routes, and only when everything was perfect would he pounce. For Robert Black, these girls were essentially disposable objects. He would abduct them in these blitz attacks off the streets. He'd abuse them, and then he would just discard them. He, he really was the, the most remorseless offender. Robert Black had now killed four young girls in just over four and a half years. His appetite for abducting, abusing, and murdering young children would only intensify. The police had connected the murders of three of the young victims, but they were no closer to catching the killer. But a chance encounter would soon change everything. In July 1990, Black is still driving his van. And this time, he returns to the borders of Scotland, a little town called Stowe. A retired post office worker is mowing his lawn when he sees a van pull up. He also sees a young girl walk past the van. And then he sees the young girl lifted up and whisked into the van. With great presence of mind, this, this uh, guy noted the number of this van uh, accurately and immediately phoned the police. Uh, the police attended, and as they were standing, uh, discussing the issue on this little road in Stout. Black drives back down the same road where the same post office worker shouts, that's the van. And it is the same van, and it is Black driving it. A policeman stepped out, stopped the van, then detained the driver, um, and then searched the van, first found nothing, and then found the wee girl lying in the bottom of the van uh, in a bag, semi-suffocated. And the man who opens the back doors of the van is the little girl's father, who's a policeman. Can you imagine what impact 
that must have had on him. There can be no doubt that it was Black's overconfidence, his arrogance, to do something so outrageous in broad daylight in a tiny Scottish town, and what's more, then to drive back down the same road in which he's abducted. And thankfully, the little girl is still alive. She's been sexually assaulted, but she's escaped with her life. It's important to understand that a serial killer of the kind that Black was, he, he was a, an obsessed serial killer, not an incidental serial killer. He, he was destined to kill over and over and over again. Had he not have been caught that day, that girl would have died and many others would have died. Now, immediately, Robert Black was arrested for that. Um, literally, within the hour, we knew this was the man we were looking for because the, 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 the modus operandi was, was, so, was so identical. On the 10th of August, 1990, Black pleaded guilty to the abduction and sexual abuse of the six-year-old girl in Stowe. He was given a life sentence and was sent to Salton Prison in Edinburgh. Black wanted to appeal the sentence, but his lawyers decided that he should be psychologically examined before they started the process. And they ask Ray Wire, who was then the country's leading expert at dealing with men who sexually abuse children. Ray went to visit Black in prison and over two days assessed him and wrote a report for the solicitors. And that report said... This killer story begins in 1949. Robert Andrew Badella Jr. was born on January the 31st, the first of two sons. He was raised in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, in a strict Catholic household. His father worked at the Ford Motor Company. His mother was a homemaker, so they were very much the traditional American nuclear family. Badella was a shy, intelligent child who struggled to fit in at school. He was bullied by his peers because he did stand out as different. He wore very thick glasses. He went to the algebra club. He collected stamps. So there was that sense in which he always felt that isolation from his peer group. Then, in his mid-teens, his world was turned upside down. Badella's father died of a heart attack when he was 16, and this did have quite a significant impact on him because his mother remarried and she went on to set up another home with somebody else. And I think that Badella really did feel a sense of rejection here. He was part of his mother's past. The world had moved on and he was left behind. Around the same time, Badella had been working part-time. There's a particular incident that Badella later recalls that is potentially significant. Badella claims that he was raped when he was an adolescent at a restaurant where he worked. Badella never reported the incident to the police. In 1967, after graduating high school, Badella enrolled in Kansas City Art Institute. At this time, he'd begun exploring his sexuality. He'd realized that he was certainly gay. And it was pretty apparent to him that his father would not have approved of that. He's also been brought up in the Catholic Church, so I think there is very much an underlying sense of shame there. By 1969, Badella had begun to experiment with drugs. He quit college after tutors failed to understand his twisted art projects, often involving live animals. He may have been a bit nerdy to look at, and a bit strange, but he was clearly talented. In need of a job, Badella put his talents to a new use. Badella started working as a short order chef and quickly rose. He developed quite a good reputation in the local community as people were talking about the food that he was making. And he bought his own house. He had quite a bright future. He really was a figure that commanded respect in the local community. By his mid to late 20s, Badella had also developed a passion for collecting, and this hobby soon became a business in its own right. He was obviously a very good chef, but it wasn't his only talent. He also collected art and antiquities. This was a man of quite considerable taste, working at some of the best restaurants, and at the same time operating a boutique called Bob's Bizarre, Bizarre selling art and antiquities. 
The boutique became Badella's full-time job and he began to rent out rooms in his home to help make ends meet. Some of those lodgers were vulnerable young men who'd received bed and board in return for carrying out jobs around the house and at his antique shop. People who'd run away from home, young gay men, uh, couples, uh, rather a sort of benevolent figure. Badella had developed a sick taste for torture and murder. And after getting away with his first crime, he began to look for ever-increasing horrific ways to get his sexual kicks. Nine months after he tortured and murdered his first victim, 19-year-old Jerry Howell, Robert Badella took his next victim. So Robert Sheldon was somebody who had stayed with Badella before at his house. So there was a degree of trust in this relationship, and it was trust that Badella really did take advantage of. On April the 10th, 20-year-old drug addict Robert Sheldon appeared at Badella's door looking for somewhere to stay after an argument with his girlfriend. Shortly after he set foot inside, Badella put his sadistic plan into action. He keeps him for four days. Automatically, you know that this is going to be somebody who's in distress. He starts to escalate his cruelty with this victim. He injects drain cleaner into his eyes. He fills his ears with caulking material. There's damage to the hands from piano wire. He's hitting him with a rubber mallet. All of these things are acts of cruelty and they would not kill you. It's subduing the victim. He did some horrendous things to him, but the thing that really stood out for me was the tattoo that he gave this victim on his shoulder. He was almost branding this man, saying, you are mine, I own you and I possess you. Like he had with his first victim, Badella documented his methods by writing intricate notes. This time, he went one step further and included himself in the photographs with his tormented victim. He wanted an absolute record of everything he'd done. It was a certain amount of pride. There is no doubt whatever that that's what was in his mind. He documented it because he was proud of it. On the 14th of April, Badella arrived home to find a workman he knew on the roof of his property. Concerned that he'd be discovered, he decided to kill Robert. And he becomes quite paranoid because he knows this guy. So Badella takes matters into his own hands and he goes and places a plastic bag over the head of his victim, essentially ending his life. Badella began his ritual act of cutting up his victim's body piece by piece. Dismembering a body is not the easiest thing in the world to do, but if you have some knowledge, like a surgeon or a chef, then you can quite effectively dismember a body, and that makes it easier to dispose of. This horrific expertise in chopping up bodies later earned Badella the nickname the Kansas City Butcher. In keeping with his obsession with collecting, this time Badella decided he wanted to keep a souvenir of his actions. Badella second victim, Robert, he dismembered the body and cut off the head. But this time, he didn't put it all into black garbage bags and put it out for the garbage truck. He kept the head first in the freezer in his house, and he later buried it in the garden where it decomposed as a kind of trophy of the killing. And this is really significant for me because the head is what gives somebody their identity. It's what makes them a human. I think by keeping the head, Badella wants to be able to say, I'm the one that has depersonalized this individual. I'm the one that's dehumanized them. Badella had now tortured and murdered two people without being caught. On March the 29th, 1988, he picked up 22-year-old male prostitute Christopher Bryson and took him back to his house. So Christopher Bryson was wandering the streets when Robert Badella picks him up and he offers him a beer and they, they drive around in his car for a while. Badella then says, well, come back to my house and you can have a beer there. So Christopher agrees and they go back. 
he was brought home to provide sexual favors for, for Della and was told to go upstairs as soon as they got there. As Bryson mounted the stairs and started walking up, he was struck from behind and rendered unconscious. With his victim sedated and held captive, Bedella began his deadly ritual. Once again, he is tortured, he is assaulted, he is given bleach in the eyes, but this time it's swabbed onto the eyeballs rather than injected in. That would probably be even more painful. There are many nerve endings on the globe of the eye which would react very badly to the bleach. Repeatedly electrocuted, raped and injected with a cocktail of sedatives, Christopher remained a submissive captive for four days. But on the morning of April the 2nd, 1988, when Badella had left for work, Christopher managed to set himself free. He finds some matches and he's able to actually burn through the robes that Badella had restrained him with. So he flees the house wearing only a dog collar. He must have been an extraordinary sight, a naked man wearing a dog collar. He runs across the street, meets a meter reader who's going to a house. They knock on the door. The house owner is astonished, opens the door, astonished, won't let Christopher into the house, but does call the police. Roy Orth was a sergeant with the Kansas City Police Department when they received the call. Chris had been severely physically abused uh, and was asking for help. District officers got there, found this was probably going to be some kind of an unlawful restraint uh, abduction situation and called the uh, Sex Crimes Child Abuse Unit and our detective responded. Rick Holtzclaw was the assistant prosecutor for the Sex Crimes Unit in Kansas City. Roy Orth called me and said, we need you. And I said, you don't need me today. Um, and he said, no, I'm telling you, we need you on this one. He may have told me briefly what it was, that we had someone who had escaped naked with a dog collar. It became evident that they were going to need some assistance. So I went to the home on that Saturday afternoon, and we began the investigation, getting search warrants. And that's how it began. In just over a three-year period, Badella had held brutally raped, tortured, and killed six men and got away with it. Unknown to the police, they were about to uncover the shocking crimes committed by a sadistic serial killer, Robert Bedella. Troy Cole was the lead detective in charge of the case. I first became aware of him uh, April 2nd, 1988. Um, I was working in the homicide unit. It was a Saturday and I uh, was called out in regards to a sodomy. The guy alleged that he had been kidnapped and held captive for a number of days, and I was the duty sergeant, which meant that I handled the homicides, the robbery, and the sex crimes for that particular day. Christopher managed to escape and flag down a passerby. That's what brought us to the residence. The traumatized victim recounted his ordeal and gave police the name and address of his captor, when Berdella arrived home that evening, the police were waiting for him. Levi Belfield was born into a Romany gypsy family in Isleworth, West London, on the 17th of May, 1968. He was one of five children. Age 10, Belfield lost his father to leukemia, and as a result, he formed a very close bond with his mother. Belfield was a... Um very much a mother's boy, much beloved of his mother. It was a close-knit family, brought up in West London, in, the, in, in a, what was effectively once a huge community of uh, travellers, and was groomed to thinking from the very early days that he was very special, that there was something particular about him. His mother encouraged him in that view. I think during his childhood, he was a bit of a tear away. Uh, he was a, a young lad who, who wanted to do what he wanted to do and, and, and not much stood in his way. So he was often kind of larking around and, and getting into a bit of trouble at school, but, but nothing completely out of the ordinary. 
By the time Belfield was 13, he'd had his first brush with the law and was arrested for burglary in 1981. It would not be the last time he was in trouble with the police. I believe Belfield occupied what you might describe as the halo of Levi Belfield. I am greater than anything. He was above the law, above suspicion, operated entirely under his own steam, in his own way, at his own time. In 1989, 21-year-old Belfield set up home with a girlfriend. They went on to have four children together. He could literally charm the birds off the trees. This is a 19 and a half, 20 stone man with a huge neck, almost occupying his entire shoulders. He wasn't an attractive man, but my goodness me, he had the gift of the gap. And he didn't half use it to his advantage, particularly when it came to girls. On March the 21st, 2002, 13-year-old schoolgirl Amanda Dowler, known affectionately as Millie, went missing from her home. Journalist Martin Brunt remembers that day very well. She was on her way home, she got off the train, was going to walk um, the half mile or so back to her home. She was in her school uniform, very identifiable. This was daylight, busy time of the afternoon, lots of people around, but nobody saw anything. Millie had phoned her father to say she was heading home, but never arrived. She seemed to have disappeared into thin air. There was CCTV footage of her getting off uh, the train at Walton Station. Some very blurred images of cars and uh, the odd person in the street where she was headed home, but nothing more than that. And it became clear very early on that police were really struggling to find what had happened to her. The last sighting of Millie Dowler was on Station Avenue in Walton, just 50 yards from the home of Levi Belfield. The search has taken in stretches of water, including the River Mole, but police have been concentrating on ground near the busy station and interviewing commuters. We have nothing that's, uh, that um, gives us any positive indication that she's gone off of her own volition. Um, equally, we have no positive information that she has been taken off the street and abducted. Um, at this time, all of our lines of inquiry are open. On September the 18th, 2002, six months after her disappearance, the body of Millie Dowler was found by a group of foragers amongst the trees of Yateley Heath Wood in Hampshire. So Millie was identified through dental records. She was known to be missing. Dental records were obtained and then they were compared to the remains that were present and sadly for her family, it confirmed that that's who it was. It was clear to forensic ecologist Professor Patricia Wiltshire that Millie's body had been in the woods ever since she disappeared. I was able to tell the police how long each bone had been there and whether, how long ago it had been moved because the bones were moved around by animals, you see. There was no doubt in my mind, really, that she had been there since the early spring. How Millie was killed remained a mystery. The degree of change that the body goes through after death, particularly in the sort of timescales we're talking about with Millie Dowler, really hinders what the pathologist can see, what the pathologist can say. It doesn't mean that there's nothing we can see or say, but clearly the less we have to work with, the more difficult it is. One likes to be objective, one likes not to think of the remains as a person, one likes to, to just look for the evidence and be yet you try to be objective. And then, of course, they take you into a scenario where you become fairly emotional. Well, you can't help it. It's an emotional sort of scenario. And then it comes a bit of a shock, really. The police had no suspects and no forensic evidence. And just five months after the discovery of Millie Dowler's body, only a few miles from Walton-on-Thames, another young woman was murdered. At around midnight on the 3rd of February 2003, in Kingston, London, 19-year-old Marsha MacDonald caught the bus home after a night out at the cinema with friends. It was the last time they would ever see her. 
Walking home, Marsha was attacked from behind, less than 100 yards from her parents' front door. Colin Sutton was one of the lead detectives with the Metropolitan Police at the time. Well, Mar Marsha was found on the street where she lived, 10 or 15 doors down from her parents' house. Uh, local resident heard a noise, uh, heard a whimpering, if you like, um, and called police, and she was found there with this terrible head wound, and, and she was taken to hospital and uh, died two or three days afterwards. Marsha was killed with a single blow to the back of the head with a heavy implement. Forensic evidence suggested the weapon used was most likely a hammer. Hammers are effective striking tools, so it's no great surprise that you can cause very severe damage to a human skull with relatively little effort with an effective hammer. You'll often see lacerations, they're often curved to match the profile of the hammer, and you'll often see skull fractures. They're quite often depressed, so pushed inwards towards the brain because the hammer is exerting its force so focally. Nightfall and detectives in Hampton still work on, but though they've searched tirelessly all day, they remain baffled as to who carried out this apparently random attack. Often these things happen and are carried out by somebody the victim knows. Um, in this case, I'm sure police looked at boyfriends, family members, but very quickly ruled out uh, any kind of suspect like that. So it soon became obvious that this was a stranger murder, and those are very rare. So very soon, very quickly after uh, Marsha's murder, people in the area became very concerned that there was a killer on the loose. Subsequent investigations led police to a mentally unstable 16-year-old who wasn't competent enough to be charged or even interrogated about the incident. And as a result, he was sectioned and was, was put into uh, to some sort of institution uh, compulsorily. And although he hadn't been charged with the offence, everybody kind of thought, well, it was him, and so we can put that offence to bed and, and, you know, we've solved that, if you like. But then investigators noticed a possible link to similar attacks that had happened in the area in the months before. There was another 16-year-old schoolgirl that... Um, she was thought at first to have slipped over in the snow and banged her head, and it was only then when Marsha was murdered that police looked at this occurrence some um, two months previously and realised that that could have been an assault as well. And they went back to this girl who had been treated in hospital uh, and were able to talk to hospital staff and look at the description of her wounds and some photographs and conclude that the likelihood was that she too had been attacked but had survived. We found a couple of other offences as well. Again, young ladies had been attacked in the street and hit over the back of the head. And in both these cases, they'd survived. However, none of these other victims were able to identify the attacker. They just, you know, said we, I was walking along and the next thing I knew, I woke up in hospital some hours or some days later. So we didn't have any kind of clue or sighting that led us towards the suspect for it because they just simply couldn't remember it. All of the attacks seemed to be totally unprovoked. Could they all have been committed by the same perpetrator, the man who murdered Marsha McDonnell? By joining the dots, Colin and his team could link Belfield to another vehicle, the car that ran Kate Sheedy down. And one of the times that he was arrested was in May 2004, when he was arrested for kidnap, which was kidnapping the landlord of a pub near where he lived in West Drayton. And nothing happened about it, and the landlord in the end said, oh, no, it was just a prank that went wrong, don't worry about it, didn't want to press charges, no charges were brought. But the crucial thing was that that arrest took place, and that abduction took place, indeed, in a vehicle, and that vehicle was a white Toyota Previa. Kate Sheedy had been attacked in Isleworth, not by being hit across the head, but by being run over by a large vehicle, and she said that this vehicle was something like a Ford Galaxy. Of course, that's exactly what a Toyota Previa is. The white people carrier. That was actually on my drive about two weeks before he 
ran Kate Sheedy over with it, only because he asked me if he could leave it there for a couple of nights, and I begrudgingly said yes. And I got somebody to go and do a check on the number plate of the previa that Levi had been arrested in, and I remember her saying to me, Governor, I think we might have hit the jackpot, and said it was white. We now had somebody, Levi Belfield, who had the right kind of white van that was used at the time Emily Delagrange was murdered, and the right type of vehicle at the time that Kate Sheedy was run over. Belfield was now the prime suspect. At dawn on the 22nd of November 2004, police raided his West Drayton home. In the attic is a naked Levi Belfield. He'd covered himself up in the hope that no one would find him. Well, they did, and indeed the sergeant got him down and he duly handcuffed him. Of course, he said to us, oh, I was only hiding because I thought it was a gang, I thought it was somebody after me. Well, it was somebody after you, Levi, but it was the murder squad. Born in Excel on the 6th of November 1956, Mark de True was the oldest of five children. His parents were teachers and at one point emigrated to the Belgian Congo where they taught. But when the crisis erupted in that country, they brought Dutroux back to Belgium in 1960. His parents eventually separated in 1971 and 15-year-old Dutroux stayed with his mother. We know that his mother was incredibly dominant, his father was very aggressive. So I think it was quite a hostile environment to, to grow up in. And I think those attachments or lack of attachments with his parents in those early years did play quite a, a role in, in the person he became. Trained as an electrician but often unemployed, De True soon began a long criminal history, including convictions for car theft, mugging and drug dealing. Dutroux had a lot of contact with the police. He stepped up from car theft into a rather grand form of car theft, which involved shipping quite expensive luxury cars, which he'd stolen in Belgium, out of the country into Czechoslovakia and Hungary. The profit from his crimes led to Dutroux owning seven properties in and around the city of Charlois, 45 miles south of Brussels. By 1983, 26-year-old Dutroux was married with two children, but he'd begun an affair with a schoolteacher called Michel Martin. The 23-year-old would eventually become Dutroux's partner in life and crime, with whom he also had three more children. The severity of Dutroux's crimes escalated from theft to sexual assault, and in 1989, he was found guilty of the abduction and rape of five young girls, one of whom was just 11 years old. Mark Dutroux was a predator who selected his prey very carefully. He wanted to choose people who were easy to, to target in the first place, easy to abduct, but also easy to manipulate once he had them under his control. So he would go for the most vulnerable victims that, that he could find that fulfilled his desires. Dutroux's now wife, Michelle, was found to be complicit in the abductions and served two years of a five-year sentence. The psychiatrists suggest that Martin and Dutroux, husband and wife, are a classic example of folie à deux, that one egged the other on, and that therefore the sum of the two of them was even more dangerous than one alone. I think when we look at the relationship between Dutroux and his wife, who was implicated in, in many of his crimes, it is quite interesting. Um, it, it's quite possible that, that, that some people see her as, as just another one of his victims, somebody else who was manipulated and, and coerced by him. Um, and when we look at Mark Dutroux and his behaviour, he is incredibly charming at times and he can be very persuasive. Um, so it, it wouldn't surprise me if he'd set out with the intention of recruiting somebody to, to help him in his crimes. And this is somebody who, who fell for his charms and, and went along with it. In December 1995, Dutroux was arrested in relation to a car theft. He was convicted and served almost four months in prison. During this time, the police searched his Marcinelle home. 
they were agonizingly close to finding out the true's darkest secret. Twice in December 1995, on the 13th and the 19th, police searched the house in Shalwa. One of the most poignant and tragic parts of that search, which included a search of the basement, was that the police failed to identify the dungeon. Even more horrifying, the two policemen who searched the house were accompanied by a locksmith who would help them. The locksmith told the policeman that he heard screams. The policeman said, oh, it must be from outside, and disregarded him. The terrible truth is that it was from the two eight-year-olds hidden in this cell, this dungeon. At the True's house, officers had also found several VHS cassette tapes, but investigators didn't watch them until much later. There was a video, a home video made by Mark Dutroux, um, where he was filming the developments in the works in his, his child cage. This was, was essential proof that they were on, 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 the, on the right track. But for some, some strange reason, they did this house search and they didn't exploit the, the information they got from it. The police mistakes came at a fatal cost. By the time Dutroux arrived back home after his release from prison in March 1996, Julie Lejeune and Melissa Russo were dead. Dutroux, his wife Michelle Martin, and an accomplice, Michelle Lalievre, were taken in for questioning. Over several hours of interrogations, all three maintained their innocence. He was consistent in his lies, following each lie by telling another lie. It was a manipulative behavior. But otherwise, he stayed very, very calm. Belgian authorities had no choice but to eventually release Lalievre, who denied being with Dutroux on the day Letitia was kidnapped. But moments after he left the police station in Charlois, a startling witness account came through. Les voisins de la maison de the neighbors of his property in Marcenay saw Marc Dutroux and Lilev return on Friday evening carrying a child covered by a blanket as they returned to his house, to Dutroux's house. Lelièvre was immediately re-arrested and taken back into custody. As his accomplice's alibi began to crumble, Dutroux's interrogation took a drastic turn. Dutroux knows that we had proof that Letitia was in the car, so he says, yes, I was in Batrice, which he denied at the start. I met a young girl, I talked with her, and then she told me she was tired of her parents. Stories, because there are parts against him and he changes the stories to suit his narrative on the spot. Then, at the same time, Lilev said she was with the true, and finally on Thursday, he ends up telling us, now that all of these parts of the story contradict each other, I will give you the two girls. De True pointed to a poster inside the interrogation room of another missing girl, Sabine Darden. 12-year-old Sabine had been kidnapped by him in May. Two days after his arrest, De True confessed and took the police to the basement where Sabine and Letitia were found alive. On the 15th of August, 1996, Dutroux led the investigators to his property in Marcinelle, where hidden behind a false wall in the basement was the dungeon where he'd been keeping Sabine Darden and Letitia Del Hay locked up. He pulled down the wardrobe and inside the cage behind was Sabine and Letitia. And then we got this, yeah, at that moment, incredible news that two kidnapped girls had been found alive in the cage of a, a person who had been convicted before for this kind of crimes. It was such a huge thing. All the journalists were on the scene at the time. The news, magazines were there. 
It is as if there had been a terrorist attack. No one could believe that such a person could exist in Belgium. It was unthinkable. Douglas de Conning was one of the few journalists who was allowed to enter de True's basement. We had seen pictures, we had been seen images, but being there is, is uh, difficult to describe because it's, it's, it's like constructed to, to, you wouldn't even put a dock in uh, such a small place. This was really the, the, the kind of cage they made to, to, to hide guns from the police. As Belgium awoke in shock to the news that a man from Marcinelle had abducted, raped and tortured two girls over several months, the families of Sabine Darden and Letitia Delhay rejoiced that their daughters had been found alive. They are rare occasions when we find the relatives and a policeman or a magistrate has the opportunity to return a child who have been kidnapped in such circumstances alive. It's fantastic, obviously. It is a joy that can be shared with the parents. Over the next 48 hours, investigators continued to relentlessly question De True. They were desperate to find the two eight-year-old girls, Julie Lejeune and Melissa Russo, who'd been missing for more than a year. Dutroux was playing a game with his investigators. He knew that uh, he, he never would get out of prison anymore. He knew that he would be presented as uh, the most famous criminal we've ever had in Belgium. And he wanted to exploit that situation. He had to be flattered. They had to make him believe that they believed his pitiful story, make him believe that things were not that bad for him. It's true that you were ingenious on this one. You were not caught and you fooled the police and here and there. At that point, his ego, his ego had been flattered and little by little he let information slip. That's his attitude. After 48 hours of this cat and mouse game, Mark Dutroux finally revealed to investigators that he had abducted the two eight-year-old girls. 